Let's crack on with what we're here for, gadgets, and this week, smartphones. Yes, and it won't have escaped your attention that recently Apple launched this, the 4S. Yep. Apple lovers will love it. Apple haters will hate it. But what's interesting is it moves through its little short lifespan. Will they continue to hold those positions? Will the lovers keep loving and will the haters keep hating? And will the rest of us just be left wondering, is it the best smartphone to buy? Well, we intend to answer that question this week by testing, pushing, prodding and poking the iPhone 4S to find out really if it's that good or that bad. Apple launches are rarely modest affairs, and the recent launch of the iPhone 4S was no exception. Legions of Apple fans queued at Apple stores, some of them for days, to be greeted by those familiar whoops and cheers, and to pay homage to the late great Steve Jobs by being the first to get their hands on Apple's new wonder gadget, the iPhone 4S. In fact, with all the fuss that people have been making, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is the only gadget you'll ever need. But is it at the stage where it's made all our other gadgets redundant. I decided to try a little experiment to test the 4S against everything it sets out to imitate and ask, is the iPhone 4S really a good deal? But first, I had to find the gadgets for my iPhone to go up against, but I couldn't just throw in any tech I fancied. My iPhone 4S cost £500, so that would be my budget. And for my £500, I got a basic mobile phone, netbook, digital camera, music player, games console, sat-nav, e-reader, HD video recorder, and a host of smaller items like a stopwatch, compass, portable weather station, digital clock, calculator, address book, and a diary. Look at all of this stuff here, and it fits into something which is what? Basically the size of a chocolate bar. A single smartphone couldn't beat the combined power of this lot, surely. Either way, I'd soon find out. It was the clash of the titans. The iPhone 4S versus my colossal bag of standalone gadgets, both of which I'd carry around all day and pit against each other in a series of tech challenges. Now, one of the things that I find disappointing with a smartphone is the battery life. It just doesn't seem to be able to keep up with the demand of wanting to play on it all day. So something like the 4S has about 200 hours of standby, whereas if you pick something like this little Samsung, and yes, I know it's an ugly little runt, however, because it has basic functionality, it does have 560 hours of standby time. 560 hours. So the bag of tech had begun well. But how smart is a smartphone when it comes to internet browsing and email capabilities? I bought a refurbished eMachines netbook and decided to see how it compared with the iPhone at loading up a YouTube video. Three, two, one, go. Using the same internet connection to buffer my video, the laptop began slightly quicker, but the overall difference was marginal. I reckon there was about one second's worth of difference. Much of a muchness, really. So I called it a draw. A point apiece to both the iPhone 4S and my bag of tech, keeping my bag of tech in the lead. But how good was the iPhone's camera? My budget afforded me a Nikon Coolpix, which had a 10 megapixel sensor with digital zoom. But how did their photos compare? Wow, that, that's amazing, actually. The detail is much stronger in the iPhone picture than the Nikon, isn't it? Well, I think this clearly proves that when it comes to photography, you're not compromising your technology at all in the iPhone 4S. In fact, it's better. To all, the iPhone was on the comeback trail. But would the iPhone's HD video recorder be just as impressive when compared to a £40 Toshiba B10? I'm impressed with both of these. 1080p full HD in such tiny little boxes. But when it comes to videoing, I would always go for this because it's a big clear screen and I can reverse the camera so when I'm filming myself, I can see what I'm doing. So the iPhone was in the lead and I was starting to get a bit hacked off with my bag of standalone gadgets. Carrying all this technology around is a complete pain in the bottom. However, if you want to read an e-book, I don't think that pocket size is the way to go. The tiny, shiny screen on the iPhone just couldn't compete with the Amazon Kindle when it came to comfortable reading. The truth is that e-ink and e-paper makes for a much easier read on the eye. It doesn't reflect the light, so I think in this case, this standalone technology wins hands down. It was now three all, and when I got a local taxi driver to compare the iPhone's basic Google Maps-based navigation system with my £80 TomTom, he was sure which he preferred. TomTom. The TomTom. The TomTom. Why? The directions are easy to follow on the Tom Tom. However, the iPhone's iPod heritage meant it won hands down when I judged it as a music player. Well, it sounds all right, and it's got an FM radio, but you just wouldn't, would you? And also when I used it for portable gaming. 
Oh, this is all I could afford in my budget. And I love a bit of retro, but seriously, there is no contest. Bringing the final score to 5-4. But if I had to pick a winner... I think that the iPhone 4S does convergence beautifully. And I'd much rather have this than this any day of the week. Get you with your little rucksack. Or oh. your big rucksack, actually. Who'd choose that? I know, but then equally I could see the argument. You made a good argument for both alternatives, the convergent device and the separates. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating area. In fact, we were debating this at the very beginning of the Gadget Show seven years ago, yeah, weren't we? Were. we were. Are these smartphones going to clear all these things up? And clearly the answer is yes. Can I flick your ear now? Please, flick it. Ow! Welcome back. Let's talk watching television. I dare say most of you right now are sat in front of your TV set enjoying the gadget show. And up until a few years ago, it was the only place you could enjoy watching TV at home. But nowadays, there's enough technology, gadgets and devices out there to allow you to view television anywhere you like. Seriously, absolutely anywhere. <laughs> The average Briton spends more than four hours a day watching TV. But given that we're also pushing the top of the pile for the amount of hours spent at work, how on earth are we fitting all this viewing in? Well, it's tech that's making it all possible. And to prove it, I'd taken on a challenge of titanic proportions. I decided to ascend all three and a half thousand feet of Wales's highest peak, Mount Snowdon, to answer one question. Can tech really allow us to watch TV anywhere? Now, I'm no mountaineer, and as you can see, I've got a lot to carry. So what I'm going to do is catch one of those trains. Well, what would you do? I'm not climbing up it. Well, it is a 1,085-metre-long incline. And besides, this wasn't such a bad idea, as millions of us commute on public transport every day. Maybe not to the top of a mountain, but you get the idea. And just like anyone on public transport, I'm reliant on my 3G signal, which isn't the best at the moment, but it should be enough to keep me watching. With 3G, most smartphones and tablets can now access dedicated TV websites like TV Catch Up and Sky Go. TV Catch Up is an example of a completely free service that you can access through your smartphone, your tablet or your computer. It has a full list of freeview channels at your fingertips and you can watch it anywhere. Services like Sky Go, which come with their own dedicated app, let you watch live sports, news and movies on the go for free or for a fee if you're not already a subscriber. The only catch with connecting these via your smartphone is that they can use an extortionate amount of data. And that could see your TV viewing grind to a halt. But there is a solution, Onovo, which can reduce your data consumption by up to 80%. Onovo is an app that compresses data. A bit like deflating a balloon, it makes everything you stream or download to your phone a little bit leaner on data size and a lot more forgiving on your phone bill. Which means I can get almost five times my TV viewing in with my data allowance. After nearly an hour of TV viewing, I was almost halfway up to the summit, but at the mercy of a dwindling 3G signal, which was slipping away fast. No, no signal. So, while the train made a stop to refuel, I hooked up the next bit of tech from my TV catch-up arsenal. I've got the latest, greatest MiFi from 3. My mobile connects to the MiFi like it would a Wi-Fi hotspot. And unlike my mobile phone, it features vastly improved antennas for data connectivity and combines multiple 3G signals, meaning that I end up with a speedy data connection where my mobile on its own would struggle. This is really good. But if you don't want to shell out the relatively hefty price of the MiFi, there is another way. And it's these portable TV receivers that allow you to pick up actual digital TV signals in the places where your data connection is likely to let you down. And my favourite is this, it's the Algarte TiviZen. You don't have to plug your devices directly into it. Once it picks up a TV signal, it creates its own Wi-Fi network that you can then connect your compatible devices to. Ah, oh, nice! Once the train had refuelled, I made haste for the summit. But the closer I got to the peak, the more my TV tech began to struggle. Oh, man! No signal! But I wasn't going to let the mountain get the better of me. My 3G signal was gone, my TV receiver's dead, but I wasn't finished yet. After all, I had TV to watch. Now, you may think that when it comes to watching TV, being sat atop the highest summit 
in England and Wales, Snowden, that is, might be an issue. Well, you'd be wrong, my friends. You'd be wrong. OK, let's face it. There was no way I was picking up live TV here. But that wasn't going to stop me. The bed. Now, before I left home, I'd actually pre-recorded my favourite TV shows on this, the first Freeview HD USB stick. Slotting directly into my laptop, the HD USB stick allowed me to do something I had never, ever done before. Watch the gadget show atop a mountain's peak. We no longer have to be slaves to the day-to-day -day scheduling of television. We can watch TV where we want, whenever we want. Now, if you don't mind, I've still about two hours of televisual entertainment to get through, and I'd like to do that before my lips freeze up. Just love the lengths you went to there to push this technology <laughs> to breaking point. Some really interesting and quite different solutions there, particularly like the little di digital TV breakout box uh, that connects via Wi-Fi. Yes, the Tivizen. Of course, we had a look Brilliant. at its precursor, the Tizzy, last year. It's getting better, it's getting stronger, and ultimately allowing you to watch TV pretty much wherever you are. Good stuff. Now, from television to radio. You could be forgiven for thinking that in the age of the internet, Radio is the runt of the digital media family, but actually nothing could be further from the truth, especially if you look at the current crop of internet radios. The subject of this week's Top 5. The radio was one of the first ever mass-marketed gadgets and is without a doubt a staple piece of tech in every household across the land. But what if you're sick of the same old, same old radio, crackly all-day news and advert-riddled cheese? Well, here's something that might interest you. Internet radios that connect to your broadband via your Wi-Fi and give you access to literally millions of radio stations from around the world. But which one is best? Well, to find out, I gathered a pile of internet radios together and put them through their paces. First up, I wanted to see how easy each radio was to set up. Ah, switch it off and switch it on again. Of course, they all work using your Wi-Fi connection. But how smooth are they to connect? And would any of them need any extra configuration? Okay, so straight away, I think, I'm not looking at the instructions, I should just press that. Scanning, straight away, automatically scans. While some of the radios immediately found my Wi-Fi signal. Oh, it's connected, so that's good. And connected quickly. That's so straightforward. That was just blissfully easy. Some of them weren't so intuitive and needed a bit of help. I mean, the Sony is quite complex to set up because it's got so many options. Blimey, it's taking its time, isn't it? A little bit of a faff that was, but you've only got to do it once, so as long as everything else is straightforward, it's not a biggie. And one of the radios baffled me completely. Can you hear anything? Neither can I. <laughs> With all the radios set up and ready to go, now the fun could begin. The choice of internet radio stations available is enormous, from Finnish folk music... Ah, love it. ..to Persian pop. Takes me back. I sometimes wish I'd never stopped belly dancing, you know? OK, Logitech Squeezebox Radio. But what really mattered to me was the sound quality. Robert Stream i63. And to test it, I settled on the same radio station for each device. German Classical 102. Listening for depth and clarity. As well as the technology inside the radio, the quality of the broadcast is governed by the bit rate at which it's transmitted. A relatively high quality broadcast will stream at around 128 kilobits per second. And after a bit of listening, it became clear that quite a few of the radios really delivered in the sound department. It's got a sort of breadth to it and a bass component to the sound that I didn't expect from something that, that small. But what it lacks in volume, I think it makes up for in, in just the s s spatial quality. And a couple actually shocked me with the power of their sound. Wow. Wow. It's like straddling an Arabian stallion, naked. But inevitably, they weren't all on my wavelength. Now, the, the kit sound is utterly devoid of any bass whatsoever. I'm getting a flat sound from that, really. It's like listening to a damp blanket. And so, after a thorough testing, we had our top five. 
At five, it's the Logitech Squeeze Box. While it isn't that feature heavy, its setup is painless and it produces very decent sound quality. I've got to sound really impressed. This little box squeezed in the corner of the Squeeze Box is surprisingly loud. At four, it's the Roberts Color Stream. With a responsive touchscreen and iPod dock, it has a rich, deep sound that would fill most sitting rooms. It's got a really nice, rounded sort of bass dimension to the sound, but it's also got a, a nice clarity at, at, at the top end. At three, it's the Gear 4 Party Airwave. While it's quite a basic radio, it's easy to use and really packed a punch in the sound department. It's a really big, full sound. At two, it's the Sony MX750NI. Although it's more of an all-round hi-fi than a simple radio, it's an excellent addition to any room and pumps out sumptuous sounds. I love it! I love it! I mean, I kind of expected it. Look at it. It's a proper hi-fi setup, you know? And our number one internet radio is the Pure Contour. With a simple setup and additional features like an iPod dock and music streaming functionality, it has a surprisingly dynamic sound range. Wow, that's emotional. I'm shocked. I can't believe that. How does a box that small produce a sound like that? It's black magic. That's what it is. Welcome back. Now, it's time for something sexy, powerful and exciting that I found on a recent trip to the States. And because of that, I'm going to keep this link intentionally short so that you have more time to see it. So, cut. This phenomenal tank-like transport is called the Fast Track. <laughs> but there are not many tanks that can go that quick. 65 miles an hour quick, in fact. The Fast Track is the brainchild of the Winnicky family, and even though it's a one-off, they kindly agreed to let me have a go. Right, I'm going to take this for a spin. Doesn't look very complicated from inside. There's variable speed transmission, which means there's no gears. There's just a pedal on the floor for your accelerator, for your brake, and a steering wheel in front of me. So in other words, it's a piece of cake. This feels brilliant! However, with no road wheels underneath you, cornering in the fast track takes some getting used to. Every time you turn the steering wheel, the brakes are automatically applied to one set of tracks, while the other side keeps running. Takes a bit of muscle power! So progress feels a bit like driving around the edges of a giant 50 pence piece. Now the inspiration for the fast track came from a snowmobile. And in fact, his 800 cc engine is actually borrowed from one. So the Fast Track is a hugely impressive and quick vehicle. But you've not seen the half of it yet. Keith and Nicky took the wheel to demonstrate its big party trick. <laughs> yep, the Fast Track is amphibious. The hull's a combination of plywood, fiberglass and Kevlar, so it's strong but light, which means it floats. Keith returned to dry land to show me the extra controls I'd need to master in order to travel on water. This lever here, we don't uh -huh. want to move that one. That's the transom flap in the back. When we want to go fast in the water, then we want to put that down. Lowering this changes the angle the fast track moves through the water from a bum-down position, which creates a lot of drag, to a much flatter and therefore efficient position. So we have a little rudder in the back, and we use that for steering in the water. Oh, OK, so when I'm so in the water, I only really need to think about this steering wheel. But the cleverest bit is what happens with the tracks. This is your track. OK. And if this is down, the tracks are down. If this is up, the Ooh. tracks are up. <laughs> On dry land, you need the tracks to sit well below the bodywork so that the vehicle can clear any obstructions. However, on water, <coughs> their big awkward shape acts like a couple of anchors dragging along below. But lifting them up means more of the slippery hull is exposed to the water. Clever. Wow. 
Instead of ploughing through the water like, well, a tank, the fast track now skates over it. This is known as planing. Whilst planing, it's capable of reaching a top speed of 39 miles per hour. That's proper speedboat pace. The propulsion is still coming from the tracks, which are acting like elongated paddle wheels. It's even got brakes. Pressing the pedal stops both tracks, and the hundreds of small ridges dig firmly into the water. Brilliant! Perhaps it's no surprise this clever vehicle is attracting a lot of interest, not just from adrenaline junkies, but also the military. You gotta love this machine! It's just brilliant! That was oh, amazing. So cool. It's incredible. For the military, I can't think of anything yeah. better. It, it was an incredible build as well. 60 miles an hour on land, 39 miles in the water, and the transition was seamless. It was such a powerful machine. It's amazing and, and the perfect, you know, way to get around the congestion charge in London. I think so. We on all the need Thames. one of those, yeah. don't we? Right, back to this week's challenge, which sees Jason, John and Susie on a mission to see whether the new iPhone 4S was worth the wait. Yeah, and with so many ever more sophisticated smartphones hitting the market, is the iPhone still fit to wear the king of the smartphones T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So earlier I went and did a test to see if the 4S was really good value for money by spending the same amount on individual pieces of tech. And I concluded that it's way better to have the iPhone. And I'm up next. But while it's OK talking about the technology of smartphones, what about the psychology of the people that own phones like the iPhone S and its contemporaries? Smartphones are like football teams. You're either a passionate supporter of your particular favourite or else you couldn't care less. But can people change? Can die-hard fans of a particular smartphone platform really admit that they're perhaps disappointed with their newest device? And what about those that have never had an interest in smartphones, never own one? Can they be converted? To find out, I enlisted three people to take part in a unique experiment. App developer Rob Shoesmith, who camped outside the Apple Store just to be the first to get his hands on an iPhone 4S. How long were you waiting here for? Ten nights. Professional blogger Grant Kemp, a confirmed Android lover and very critical of all Apple products. And TV professional Layla Finicarades. Well, she's never used a smartphone and has no desire to own one. Guys, I come bearing gifts. First of all, Lila, for you, an iPhone 4S. Mm. And to go with it, as if that wasn't enough, an Android phone. So what I want you to do is, is <laughs> test these to the max. Push them in the navigation department, socially network with them, even make calls, whatever make you want calls. to do. Yeah, is that a novel idea? Yeah, a little bit. Grant, you're an Android fan, and so to you, I'm giving an iPhone 4S. Thanks, Jason. And for you, sir, an iPhone 4S? I've already got one, Jace. Um, I camped out ten nights for this. I want to use my own phone if that's OK, Jay. We wanted him to give the iPhone 4S a long, cold stare to see if it really did live up to the hype. So, let the experiment begin. All three then spent a week incorporating the smartphones into their daily routines. Cheers, take out. Shoe shops, there we are, search. So we've come up, there we are. Places for shoe shops near Birmingham, perfect. Would prejudices be confirmed? The bus is going to arrive quicker than the news is going to, just at the rate that I'm going here. Or confounded. Do I need an umbrella today? There's no weather information for England. Sorry about that. <laughs> After a week, I wanted to see if their views on the iPhone had changed. But just in case our stubborn subjects had planned on bending the truth, I invited psychologist and body language expert Jeff Beatty to study them over a video link while I grilled them. First up was Apple lover Rob. Was his passion for the iPhone as strong as ever? I decided to challenge him by pointing out how inflexible the iPhone is. What, what Android offers mm. is the flexibility to, to change your phone into any user experience mm. that you want. You can personalise it. The actual Apple iPhone is exactly what I need, and I don't particularly want to customise it. But was Rob telling the truth? After studying the interview, Jeff gave his opinion. Well, from a psychology point of view, Rob is more than just a fan of the iPhone. He's queued for 10 days to get hold of one. And that puts him in a really peculiar psychological state called cognitive dissonance. He has to rationalise why he went to so much trouble. So he cannot bear any attack on the iPhone. There were a lot of hand-to-head movements and attempt to self-comfort. Now, they started off delicately, just touching the skin. But very soon, <laughs> the hand started moving to the lips, which is a kind of infantile gesture. He was desperately trying to self-comfort. 
from Rome's point of view, any attack on the iPhone leads to a lot of psychological distress. And when he has to talk about the opposition, that also leads to a lot of psychological distress. All this psychological distress ultimately meant that Rob's real opinion was quite hard to decipher. So we have no choice but to give this win to the iPhone. Next up was Grant Kemp, the dyed-in-the-wool Android user. Had his week with the iPhone changed his opinion? The key thing is that on a day-to-day -day basis, writing long emails, it kind of it isn't the same degree of control. I decided to press him on Android's biggest problem, namely its apps. I've experienced apps on Android that don't work at all. It's a squirmy little thing, it's an afterthought. If you find that people who are using Android a lot and use it as their day-to-day -day phone, they find that there's a lot of really amazing quality out there. Did you honestly commit to using that phone in the way that you would an Android phone? Oh, absolutely. This Android fan didn't give much away to me, but what would Jeff make of his body language? When he's asked about it being a squirmy little thing, just look at his hand movements he makes. The gestures are all in this kind of space here. And when he talks about the Android, what the Android can do, the gestures are way out here, expansive gestures. So what you get here really is a very nice guy talking about you know, his commitment to using the iPhone. He may have carried it around with him. Did he fully commit to it? I don't think he did. So Grant's body language talked volumes. He clearly wasn't seduced by the iPhone. So a win this time for Android. And our first question answered, can diehard fans of one smartphone ever be convinced to switch to another? Well, probably not. So it was all down to our technophobe, Lila. She'd just spent a week with both an iPhone and an Android handset. But did either succeed in changing her opinion of smartphones? I, don't, I haven't needed to use the options that are in a smartphone. Having said this, I was recently in Europe and to get maps up, to get emails that we needed, would have been really useful. So not a complete turnaround, but her opinion had shifted. Your instinctive reaction to the iPhone, compare it to the, your instinctive reaction to the Android phone. To pick up the iPhone 4S and use it now, it's easy and I, and I quite like it. To pick up this other one, um, having them both in my hands and comparing the two, this is just a lot easier. Well, it's interesting that Lila's kind of been asked to give a kind of outsider's perspective on this. She constantly put the iPhone on the right, the right means good, and the HTC device on the left, which means bad. If she saw as a technophobe, not much difference between these two things. It would have been like iPhone, HTC. It wasn't like that. It was iPhone, HTC. Huge distance in her mind, even though she doesn't know much about these things and probably didn't use them too much. Lila's body language backed up everything she told us. So as far as I was concerned, this was a clear win for the iPhone. So if given the choice, which phone would Lila choose? The Apple. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Amazing insight from Professor Beattie there. And I think three really good candidates who thoroughly use mm. the phones and articulated whether through their mouth or their body yeah, some interesting yeah, yes, opinions. Yeah. I think it was fascinating how you managed to reveal how uh, seductive as a package it is to a more general phone user. That being said, the iPhone 4S has come out top in this round of the challenge. After the break, the gloves come off as we put it up against its closest rivals. Now, the 4S may be clever, it may be sexy, but is it the cleverest and sexiest phone out there. John's test after the break reveals all. Welcome back. Now we are going to answer the question that all gadget mags, websites and techie TV shows all over the world are asking themselves, which is the best smartphone you can buy? I agree. This is the main event, isn't it? Yeah. Ultimately, it's got to be about comparing the iPhone 4S to its contemporaries. And who better to do that than a man that has testingness flowing through his very veins? It's in his DNA. In fact, recently, he had a G-rating tattooed on his arm. <laughs> Painful, but worth it. <laughs> uh, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about smartphones. I've got six of them, and I need to see which is best. So, on with the testing. Earlier, we saw the iPhone 4S go head-to-head -head with a whole bag of tech as well as three particularly stubborn human beings. But we hadn't given it a chance to go head-to-head -head with what really matters, its rivals. And these days, there are loads of them. Ever since the iPhone became established, rival smartphones have been queuing up for a shot at the title, the chance to be the next iPhone killer. But while some have got close to knocking it off its perch, no single smartphone has managed it yet. 
So I took five of the latest smartphones, the HTC Sensation XL, the BlackBerry Torch 9810, the Nokia Lumia 800, the Samsung Galaxy Nexus, and the Sony Ericsson Xperia Arc S to find out if any of them could take the iPhone's crown. And my first tests are feast for the eyes. Three quick-fire challenges designed to see which smartphone's the best for screen quality, video camera quality, and stills camera quality. Arguably deal breakers if you're the sort of person who likes reading e-books, watching movies, or taking pictures on the move. And to help me judge each of the criteria, I'd enlisted the help of three experts. First up, screen quality. With all the phone's identities hidden, I asked art student Joe Jefford to cast his eye over the iPhone 4S and its rivals to see how faithfully they reproduced one of his paintings. What do you think of the way the phones have represented it? I think one of the, um, one of the really noticeable things is the contrast between the green and the orange. Although the iPhone has led the way in screen technology, how would it fare against the newer OLED displays of some of these rival phones? While Joe reached a decision, I moved on to the next part of my test, camera quality. For many of us, having a good one of these on a phone is vital. So let's see which one of these is best. I'd invited pro photographer Steve Gerrard to judge. I'd taken a picture on each phone and had them blown up to 10 by 12 inch matte prints. Some mm. look a little bit flatter than others, some are sharper. Some of the colours are a little bit uh, mm. unrealistic, I think. Apple claims its new chip is as good as the ones found in DSLR cameras. But here they're competing with camera manufacturers like Sony and the Zeiss optics of the Nokia Lumia. While Steve continued viewing, I moved on to the next test. And finally, to test the video quality of the phones, I've shot some similar footage with each of them, and I'm playing it back through six identical televisions simultaneously. I'd invited Brian Harley, a filmmaker, to judge the image quality. You can tell immediately there's a, the camera phones. These phones all offer HD video recording from 720p to 1080p in the case of the Samsung and the iPhone 4S. Watching on this scale would certainly push the phones to deliver good quality. So it's decision time. Joe, which gets closest to representing your work? Um, the one that really stood out for me is this one in the middle here, because the colours contrasted well, and it's a really nice, clean, crisp image. And it is... the Samsung Galaxy Nexus. Ah, Steve, now, which one's come out best? This one, just because there's clarity throughout the, the image. The colours seem to be pretty representative of what you would imagine would be there in real life. Well, it is the uh, Nokia Lumia 800. Now, Brian, I was guessing this was going to be quite a difficult decision because you didn't seem that impressed with any of them. Yeah. But um, have you chosen one? I have. Um, and? Well, they're all flawed in some way or another. Um, I've selected this one. Oh. Um, the reason being its capacity for registering detail. Now, I'm intrigued to see which one you've chosen. And it is... the BlackBerry Torch 9810. The judges were then asked to award up to six points to each smartphone, one for their worst and six for their favourite. So, after our three visual tests, it was the Samsung that emerged as our front-runner with 16 points, with the iPhone 4S in second place with 11 points. My next test is going to be all about ease of use, and I've been joined by Melissa Thompson, who's the world's fastest texter. So, you've got a phrase? Let's uh, start with the BlackBerry. I'll give it a go. Three, two, one, go. I set her off, texting with each phone using a phrase I'd created for the purpose. Each phone would receive points for how fast Guinness World Record holder Melissa Don't. could transcribe our message. Six points for her fastest handset and one for her slowest. And it was the iPhone that caused her most problems, taking a minute and 11 seconds and coming last. But which was she fastest on? So the Sony Ericsson is definitely the winner on time with that blistering time of 46 seconds. So the Sony Ericsson picks up six points, putting it into second place. But the Samsung Galaxy Nexus, with five points, maintains its lead. Now, a smartphone wouldn't be smart if it didn't have loads of processing power. In order to test the phone's speed, I'm going to time how long each one of them takes to load the Gadget Show's website. The Samsung Galaxy Nexus was first to load it in a scorching eight seconds, scoring top points again, with the iPhone a close second. But it's pointless loading a web page quickly if it's then impossible to navigate it. So I then awarded points for how easy each handset made navigating. 
and the HTC was definitely the best. But again, the iPhone got second place. So, once the points had been added up, the Samsung Nexus kept hold of its lead, but the iPhone had moved back into silver medal position. I had one final test, the biggest gripe of smartphone users, battery life. So, we put them through a cycle. An hour of making calls, followed by an hour of playing video clips, an hour of gaming, and an hour of web surfing. Scott is dead. This cycle was repeated until only one phone was left standing. And that was the iPhone 4S, after approximately eight hours on the go, giving it top honors in our final test. But when all the points from all our tests were added up, would we have a clear winner? Our final totals revealed that the Samsung Galaxy Nexus came out as the winner, followed by the iPhone 4S with the HTC Sensation XL taking third place. But the main thing my testing revealed is that all these handsets are very accomplished and all very desirable gadgets. I think you can now say definitely that the iPhone is one amongst many very good smartphones. And which one you choose really depends whether you like iOS, whether you mm. prefer Android, whether there's a particular feature you want. You've hit the nail on the head. Mm. Let me let you into a little secret. We've just been having a massive argument <laughs> about yes. which is the best <laughs> phone. And that's the whole point of this now. The competition is so close. It's really subjective, isn't it? It, it is. It's not just about Android and iOS, is it, John? The, the, mm. the Windows phone from Nokia yeah, absolutely. puts Nokia firmly back on the map. It's a great handset. Mm. You know, the, the bottom line is six fantastic piece of technology that all offer amazing experiences at last we've yeah. got a choice exactly it's, it's now you know our game it's down to the consumer isn't it yeah. which is a good thing yeah this is definitely a debate i know will continue <laughs> after we've left you so we'll see you next time yeah, see you. Bye. Bye.